Women's Zoom class on moths and other things that eat your knitting. Um, we also are going to learn about carpet beetles because we have to. And um, please jump in if you have any questions. Okay, so the first thing is how do you know if you even have a problem or how do you like, have you never worried about moths or carpet beetles? Do you, should you worry about moths and carpet beetles? And the answer is probably. You probably need to at least be somewhat vigilant for things that can get into your house and get into your clothes. And they can get into your house or your clothes many different ways. Um, the biggest one is through the windows. So even though most people have screens on their windows, our doors open and close, our windows, I know that my windows have um, drain holes at the bottom of them that things can crawl into. So if you've ever seen a mosquito or a fly or a bee in your house, you could also have clothes moths or pantry moths or carpet beetles in your house. So don't assume just because your house is clean and lovely that it can't ever have any pests in it. So what is the difference between all of those things that I just men mentioned? The difference in clothes moths and pantry moths is essentially where you will find them. You will find pantry moths in the pantry and you will find clothes moths in your closet. And they are not the same animal. They are not the same critter. They are completely different. They look a little bit different. Um, pantry moths are typically brown or grayish um, and they're a little bit larger and they, they arrive in your house typically with packaged grains and they can be found in boxes or, or um, canisters of packaged grains. And so they're evident there. They also don't like um, the dark necessarily, and they will fly towards the light. You'll see them flying around. Clothes moths are different. There are two kinds, but both of them are about a half an inch long. They're buff colored or golden colored, and they can have a fringy sort of an edge to their wings. Um, there are two kinds, like I said, one of them is webbing clothes moths and one of them is case making clothes moths and webbing clothes moths leave a webbing behind their, their larva will leave a webbing behind and that's evidence of their presence in the clothes and the case making clothes moths leave a little case, a little, it looks like a little cocoon that they drag around behind them and that's their evidence that they leave behind in clothing or in woolens. Um, both of them eat keratin. So the, the big culprit here is the presence of keratin in some product. So wool has keratin, leather, fur, feathers, um, animal hair, all of those things have keratin. Some dust has keratin because it contains skin. Um, so keratin is the item, the the, the food that the clothes moths larva are interested in. And so the kinds of things that I've just mentioned, wool, fur, silk, feathers, felt, and leather are their primary source of food inside of a house. What would they eat outside of a house? They would be in birds' nests eating the feathers and other bird debris. Um, they would be on carcasses of dead animals, eating the keratin containing items there. Um, and so in nature, you'll find the, the kind of moth that we're talking about, the clothes moths in nature will be um, finding their food source very easily. In your house, they have to find things that are an animal product. So the other, question is whether or not they can affect cotton or non-animal products, something that's not wool. And the answer is yes. If food is staining cotton or linen or polyester or any other synthetic, if food has gotten on it on the front of a sweater because you've had a salad and maybe there's a little oil or you've had um, dinner or you got sprayed with something or perspiration. So body oils and body residue from your body can also permeate your clothes. And those are two ways that clothing can be affected um, and vulnerable 
to clothes moths. An adult female clothes moth lays about 40 to 50 pinhead size eggs. And she herself does not eat. So the adult clothes moth that you might see is no danger to your clothes. She's already been a danger. So the eggs <laughs> are tiny little pinhead size things that will eventually grow into caterpillars that are about a half an inch long. They're creamy white and they can um, have a red head. I wanna show you a picture because I know you wanna see a picture of clothes moths and caterpillars. So hang on one second while I change over to the camera. So this is a picture of a pantry moth and he's grayish brown. And this is a picture of a clothes moth. And you can see this is a webbing clothes moth. And the difference between a webbing clothes moth and a case making clothes moth is this one has a reddish he head and a case making clothes moth will have darker spots on their wings. But they're similar in color and size. They're about a half an inch long. And, uh, and they have a little bit of a fringed edge to their wings. You can sort of see that their wings look broken up. That's a very common trait. Their larva, you're welcome. I know you were looking forward to this, look like that. So they're about an inch long, they're creamy in color and they have a red head. A clothes moth that is a webbing clothes moth may only leave now, this is mostly residue of their feces. So these are little fecal pellets. They look like dust. I know it's horrific. And the case making one, instead of just leaving webbing, has this case that they drag along with them while they're eating and the case can be left behind. Now I just wanna pause here because I'm talking about clothes moths, but I learned horrifically that we're also worried about carpet beetles. So a carpet beetle, is an eighth of an inch to a sixteenth of an inch and it's mottled and brown. So uh, this is one on its back and this is one on its tummy, but it's brown and black and white mottled. They're very, very small. Their larvae look like that. And the shed skin of their larvae look like that. And the reason I was horrified is because I've found these. And I'm horrified. So their larvae go to the same places. And if you've ever seen damage like this to materials, they are also found in carpets. And you can see the evidence of them in the edge of the carpet. You see that white area where things have been eaten away. So here's what we know about carpet and clothes, carpet beetles and clothes moths. They don't like light. They don't like to be in the light and they don't like to be disturbed. And that's how we're going to deal with them is we're going to shine a light on them and we're going to disturb them. But um, that's, I'm going to come to that in just a second. All right. So we've talked about the, the foods that they eat. Let's talk about the kinds of things that we need to be vigilant of. If these critters attack wool and other things that might be affected with body flu bodily fluids or food stains, here are the things you should be aware of. Rugs, curtains, any taxidermy or decorative items that have animal products on them, uh, clothing and bedding, down pillows, down comforters, toys that may have some kind of wool on them, decorative items, pet hair, and animal nests that might get into your house. So all of these can be sources of clothes moths larva or carpet beetle larva food, or can be sources of food for the clothes moth larva or the carpet beetle larva. So, and those things can be kept in vulnerable areas where they're kept in the dark or they're kept in um, an undisturbed area because it's in storage. So if you think of the things that you're storing, 
in your attic or your basement or closed off in a box somewhere or in a storage area, all of those things are potentially vulnerable to these insects getting in. They're very small. They can get in through crevices and they are attracted to the smell of keratin. So what should we do? We should, and what we do is different. Let me just clarify. It's a little bit different for our yarn versus our woolens, our actual knitted sweaters. So I'm gonna talk about just general in terms of um, woolen clothing, and then we're gonna talk about yarn. And if you have any questions, jump in. So the first thing is let's not store our things for long periods of time without inspection. Let's plan to inspect what's stored and check it for evidence of these things. And that means if you're keeping your sweaters or your clothes in a dark closet or in an upstairs attic area, have you seen anything lately? And where do you look? These animals don't like to be disturbed, so they're not going to be necessarily visible on the outside sleeve of your coat or your sweater that you see from the edge of the closet or from the center of the closet. They're probably going to be under the collar or in the cuff or somewhere in a seam or in a crease that's made from the folding. So you need to open up and shake out the items and inspect them for these little papery, tiny little papery webbing cases or, or um, the shed skins of the larva or the evidence of dust. It looks like it's like granular dust and that's what they've eaten and excreted. So you wanna be looking for webbing for these little tiny tubular cases or the shed larva of the um, carpet beetles. So if you see evidence of that or you just see holes in your clothes, that's the warning sign. You want to check everything and you want to make sure that if you found holes in something, you've checked the surrounding items. You want to remove the items from the closet and launder them as quickly as possible. So laundering will kill larva and it will remove the food and human oils and things that might be attracting them. So laundering is the first thing to do when you find any evidence of this. If there's a hole, repair, repairing the hole is possible. If it's infested and ruined, it should be gotten rid of in a plastic bag and taken out of the house because you don't know if there's any other eggs left in there. So if you've had something infested that you will not try to save, you should put it in a plastic bag, a trash bag, and get it outside of your house as quickly as possible. If you want to save it, you should launder it. If it is not washing machine launderable, then soaking it in water and using soap can kill the larva and the um, eggs. So laundering it by hand is completely doable and is completely safe. Dry cleaning will also kill and remove all of the larva and the eggs. Once you've gotten it back, you want to store it in a place that's been thoroughly cleaned. So if you found moths or carpet beetle evidence in your closet, you want to check everything and then you want to clean thoroughly, removing dust, vacuuming, and potentially wiping down with um, something like a bleach solution, if that's possible, or a disinfecting, something like you would use to kill COVID. You want to wipe out that area. So I talked to someone once who had had evidence of moths, but stored her clothes on open shelves in her bedroom. And we decided that the, and also in shelves in her dresser, and we decided the best thing was for her to wipe out the dresser with a disinfectant, as well as vacuuming for all the dust and bits. If you have pets and pet hair is accumulating in the, in the floorboards, not the floorboards, the baseboards of your rooms, um, in your closets, I know that my closets tend to have dust bunnies from the cats because they go in and they kind of roam around underneath all of the 
the clothes and then they come out. And so I'm not very good and very vigilant about vacuuming it out, but that is an area that you need to vacuum out to get rid of things. And once you've vacuumed and you're trying to prevent moths and car carpet beetles from coming back, you need to empty the vacuum, get the bag and get it out of the house just like you would an infested item. So we've washed the clothes that we want to keep. We've gotten rid of anything that we don't think is salvageable. And we are cleaning the area where we found moths. Now what? Well, there is actually a really great product that is available. So if you've had moths in your home, or if you're prone to leaving your windows open, or if you think that they might come back because you have delicious woolen things for them to eat, the thing that you can get is called um, a pheromone trap. And it's a pheromone attracting trap on a, like on a glue page. And they sell them in sets of um, five or 10. You can get them online at Amazon. Um, I actually got a lot of the information for this class from the University of Kentucky School of Entomology. Thanks. <laughs> so much great, so many great pictures. Um, and they have a source in Indiana called, let me see what the, it was called Insect, where was it? I'm on the wrong page. <laughs> Insects Limited. Insects Limited is a company that makes paper glue trap, paper glue traps for both types of moths and also a um, like a mixed beetle trap. So the issue is pheromones work for different species um, or different critters. So you can't do a case making moth trap and catch a webbing clothes moth. You have to have a pheromone that attracts the case making and a pheromone that attracts, attracts the webbing. So they sell one that does for both. And then you put it on the glue portion and it folds up like a little tent so that the moths can get in on the edges. And then you put it in your closet. So what's the point of just catching them? The point is if you've gotten rid of the moths and you set up the glue trap, they last for 60 days. So you can put the date on your calendar and in a week or two weeks or whatever, you can go in and check, are there any moths in my glue trap? No? Okay, leave it. And then after 60 days, if there have been no moths, you set up another glue trap and you keep looking for it because it will attract the adult moths and it will let you know if the early stages of an infestation are happening again. So they are very shy of light and of disturbance and they don't like to be where you can just shake them out. It's very rare to actually see a clothes moth or a carpet beetle in your house. You're gonna just see the evidence of them before you really see the, the critter itself, okay? Um, let me think. I just want to make sure I've covered all of that. Some people think that cedar chests are a good way to store and um, storage of your items is the next thing that we're going to talk about. I just want to make sure I've covered everything. We've talked about removing the vacuum bags. Okay, so we have our pheromone trap and all of a sudden we see that there's there's been an infestation again. Now, what else can we do? We, we know about removing the infected or the infested items. We know about laundering. Is there anything else? And really, what do we do with yarn? Because we can't just launder yarn so easily. What can we do with that? So I have, oh, I forgot my, my spray. I'm gonna have to go get my spray. But before I do that, um, yarn is eventually gonna be clothing. So whatever you do with yarn, it needs to still be able to be worked. So there are a couple of different schools of thought or different approaches that we can take. One, if you find an active infestation and you're afraid that things are otherwise are affected, there is a spray that is a bug killing spray. And it, I've purchased it before at the container store and I'm just gonna grab it. Can you pass me that spray can that's in front of you? It is 
toxic and it is essentially what's in mothballs, but it kills carpet beetles. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it kills clothes moths. It's called SLA spray. It costs $13 at the container store. And it comes from a company called Reefer Galler. It is cedar scented. It does not have a disgusting scent. I've used it many times. And it is not something that you want to use frequently, but it's good in an emergency. So my recommendation is if you find an active infestation, this is something that you can put the affected items into a airtight container, like a storage bot, like a storage bin, plastic storage bin, and you can spray them and then close the bin and leave it so that they're, the concentration of this chemical is in the box with the clothing. It will eventually dissipate and you can open the bin and all of the larva should be dead. So it's something like that can work, but it is poisonous and it will have to be cleaned off of the items after they're, they're worked through blocking and washing. So this is an extreme and not everybody is really excited about using pesticides. So the other ways that you can do it, if you can't- Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so for, so is that also, so basically for the yarn, if you're gonna use that for the yarn, you would need to wash the yarn before you work it. So you could wash, so you can wash yarn before you work it. You can remove mm -hmm. the label, you can keep it. Um, I, would, I would skein it, I would put it in a hank if it's in a ball. Mm -hmm. I would put it in a hank, which is another way of inspecting to see if there's any larva or breaks in mm -hmm. the yarn, but wind it into, you know, it's, it's a little extra work, but wind it into a bigger skein and you want to soak it in a tub, just like you would block something. You're not going to agitate it. You don't agitate things when you block them, but you are going to add soap and then rinse thoroughly, rinse again, and then it can be dried hanging or dried flat, just like you would dry a knitted item. Yes, but so so if you're using the SLA spray on yarn, that's what you should do that before you. I've used the yarn after without any effect. I think it evaporates. I think that the chemical in it evaporates. Mm -hmm. So I haven't ever had a problem, but I'm not particularly sensitive and I'm not particularly worried about a little bit of the pesticide you know, the, the amount that I would touch, I'm not as worried about that. Mm -hmm. However, I know that people with babies and pets and, in a, you know, or they're making it for a baby, they may not want to take that risk at all. So okay. if that's the case, maybe let's try a different approach. So the pesticide is an extreme response, but it is a workable response. The next one is cold. So I was hoping you could just put things in the freezer and then take them out and they'd be fine. And they can, but you have to have a big enough freezer for what you need to put in it. It needs to be sealed up and you have to be a little bit conscious of condensation, although it's not such a big deal in a freezer if it condensed, like if there's condensation in the plastic bag, but you want to put it in a sealed freezer bag and put it in the freezer. And then if it's a zero degree Fahrenheit freezer, it has to stay for a week. If it's minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, it only needs 72 hours. So you need to know how cold that freezer is and you need to leave it long enough that it will actually kill the larva because the larva can stand cold and they can live through fairly extreme colds for short periods of time. So, it has to be less than zero degrees Fahrenheit and or below 20 degrees Fahrenheit for enough time to actually kill the larva. And then what is recommended is that the item is returned slowly to room temperature before it's unwrapped. So you would take it out and let it thaw like your steaks. <laughs> and then you could and then you could unwrap it from the plastic and resume life assuming that now everything has been killed. The other way, and this is a way I've actually used, is heat. So heat does not require as much space in your freezer or for as long a time. And, um, and again, there are a couple of ways you can go about it. 
the way that the entomologist suggested is different than the first way that I heard of, but it makes as much sense. So I'm going to go with theirs because they're entomologists and they should know. They say to place the item directly on the rack in the oven with a cookie pan full of water below because humidity is helpful in creating the environment that will kill the larva. And then have the oven set to the lowest temperature which is usually between 150 and 170 degrees. So they feel, so this is like if you had a wooden item that might've been infested with bugs or a woolen item, anything like that, um, they feel like it can be treated at a very low oven. I mean, it's a high temperature for us, but a low oven, um, it's a high temperature for the bugs. And if you treat them that way, in 45 minutes to an hour, all of the larvae should be de dead. So the way that I did it when I had a moth problem, I think it was moth, not carpet beetle, but whatever, is that I had cookie trays of yarn in my oven for 45 minutes at a time. It was the most gruesome baking I've ever done. And then, so, but then what they say is that you bring it out of the oven and you let it cool before, or you turn the oven off and you let it cool. So they didn't have as much yarn as I do. And I had to do it in, you know, batches, like I was making cookies. The other thing that they said, and this is where people on the call on Wednesday piped in, um, is that if it can be at 120 degrees Fahrenheit for 16 to 24 hours, and so they, um, they were talking about bringing things home from woolen festivals, wool like sheep and uh, shearing festivals. And you're all maybe familiar with Rhinebeck and um, the Maryland Sheep and Wool Show. And there's, there's, there's festivals like this all over, including here in Berea, there's been festivals like this. If you're bringing home items that have come from people who are raising sheep, you could be bringing home larva. So what one of our spinners recommended was taking the, the sheared wool, putting it in a giant plastic bag, like a black plastic bag and leaving it in the back of her car, sealed up in the summer, in the heat outside for a week. And that would probably do it because what they say is 120 degrees for 16 to 24 hours. So if you're leaving things in the back of your car every day for several days, that's probably gonna be enough to kill the larva. But that's another way that you can bring something into your house without really thinking about it. Be aware that if you go to estate sales or antique stores, or you buy used carpets or used clothing, from thrift shops, that these are all places that could have larva effect or eggs affecting the clothing or the items that you're bringing in. So it's really important to inspect what you have when you get it and then periodically as you have it in the closet. You want to vacuum and clean the areas where you keep your, your vulnerable items regularly, even though they're in the closet and nobody sees them. Um, if you have animals, you want to remove pet hair from areas in your house because that can attract the carpet beetles or the clothes moths, um, even if it's not in your closet. Once they're in your house, they can get to your closet. And then use a glue trap as an early warning sign. The glue traps that I read about have um, a 60-day uh, lifespan. So you can put them out, mark your calendar, and then go and check them periodically and replace them every 60 days. And that's a good way of making sure that, that you do not have a problem, or if you have a problem, stopping it where it starts. Um, just making sure I've talked about everything. I think oh. Judy has a question. Judy has a question, yeah. If you use the glue traps, mm -hmm. Like, it, you know, you've got a closet with, you know, shelves. I mean, how, how far apart should, how many should you have? I think it's two per large room. Oh, okay. The so one in a closet will be enough. It's very, they're, they're very attractive to the adult moths. 
They think another adult moth is in there being sexy. Um, I do want to say, though, there's a big debate in storage of woolens about whether or not they should be stored in airtight containers. And we kind of discussed this on Wednesday, and I want to share a little bit about that. So first of all, a cedar chest is something that most people are familiar with as a way to prevent moths in their items. And it's actually not entirely true. A cedar chest is not always airtight. Now there are some that were built to be airtight, but if it's not airtight, then the critters can be getting in. And if it's not retreated, or if it's not airtight, sorry, it's a concentration of the repellent or lethal um, smell that is effective. So cedar in sufficient quantities can kill the moth larva, but it's rarely present in sufficient quantity in a cedar closet or a cedar chest to actually kill them. And it may, did that just kick me off Zoom? No, oh, you're fine. Okay, sorry, my phone rang and it, I had everything silenced, but not my phone. Um, so cedar chests aren't necessarily the safest place for your beloved woolen garments because the moths could still get in there and the, the concentration of the cedar smell might not repel it enough or might not kill them. So everywhere I read, it said airtight, like vacuum sealing or um, putting things into plastic containers with an airtight seal. And there's a concern if you do that, that you're going to get rid of the moths, but you're going to bring in mildew. So everything that I've read suggests that having some kind of cotton cloth in amongst the woolens to help absorb moisture is one way to do it. But I think it's sort of a combination that's going to work the best. The combination is if you are using a plastic container, a sealed plastic container to keep moths out of your, your stored yarn, that's fine, but go through it per periodically, inspect it periodically, open the container up so that the wool and other yarns are not being kept in an airtight situation because it is a natural fiber and it needs air to breathe. We also don't want mildew to, to happen. So don't store it in places that are prone to mildew. Don't put it in a damp attic or basement or storeroom if you can help it. Because mildew is a real problem and it can affect, we're not even talking about mildew today, but you don't wanna store your, your yarns in places where they can develop damp. So really, if you have the room and somewhere in, in the living area of the house, that's or apartment, that's where you want to store things. You want to store it so that it is um, in sight and in mind so that you can inspect it relatively frequently. If not once every two months, at least once a year, you should be going through your yarns and making sure everything's copacetic. So that's pretty much everything I had to say about moths. I don't know if it's everything you wanted to learn about moths. I'm going to unmute you and let, oh, maybe I didn't. Cancel. But you're, you're, uh, you're welcome to unmute yourselves, I guess. I can't unmute you. You can do it yourself. And then you can ask me any questions that you have. What about preventative? Let's, let's say I'm finished with this afghan. I wash it. You wash it. And then want to store. And you want to store. So you want to store it in a sealable airtight container, but you want it not to be there indefinitely. So you want to go through your sealed airtight containers periodically. So if you can find one that's clear that you can see through, that would be helpful. And if you put it in a room where you have the moth or the beetle traps, then you'll know if moth or beetles get in the room. Okay, can you put it in a plastic bag? Yes. And, and then with the moth traps? Yep. 
But and what were the name of the traps again? They're, uh, they're called pheromone traps. And I will share my screen. It was insect, hang on. Insect. Doop, doop, doop. Keep looking on the wrong page. Insect Limited? In, was it Insect Limited? Yeah, that's what I've written down. Okay, let me. Insect. Ooh, Insects Limited. Insects Limited. Mm hmm. So this is the company that I found um, through the entomology website from Kentucky. And they have, for homeowners, they have a joint pheromone. So they, they're concerned about the meal moth and the flower beetle, and then the webbing clothes moth and the case making clothes moths. And they do a product um, that is not what I want. I'm so sorry. That's not what I wanted. They do a product for insect pheromones. <laughs> okay, we didn't want that. Oh, I have such a tiny screen on my computer. I can't, insects. Okay, these are their products. Shop now. So they have pest kits, they have clothes moths kits, and they have food kits. And they do them in five packs and 10 packs. And they have, so they have different ones, but there also are, and there's also a beetle trap and it's for all carpet beetle lures. So you could do both. You could have a beetle and you could have a beetle trap maybe on the floor and a clothes moth thing in the, um, on, on a shelf in a closet higher up. There are also on Amazon. So you can see they're not inexpensive but neither is our yarn necessarily. And, um, and it's also, they're, they're selling 10 for $108. So each one, it costs about $10. So if every couple of months you can, you can afford it, remember what you've invested in your time and your, your yarns. Um, the SLA spray company, Reefer Galler also has, um, sachets that are essentially uh, cedar scented sachets that you can put in amongst your woolens. The caution for using mothballs, which is essentially what that is, or other types of things, is they need to be in a sealed container. Mothballs or the cedar scented sachets are toxic, and so they need to be in a sealed container so that the amount of concentration in the in the sealed container is enough to dissuade and kill the larva. Um, if they're open, if they're just scattered, that's not gonna be enough concentration to kill them and pets or children could get to them. So you really wanna be careful with using toxic substances. When I use this, I close, I do it into a closet where I store yarn and I close the door and I close the room of the door, the door of the room that that closet's in and I don't go in it for 24 hours because I really wanna give it a chance to dissipate before I go back in. Just smelling the, the stuff can give me a little bit of a headache. So it is very toxic. Um, and the sachets, they're in, a, they're in a like a tea bag sort of a paper and you can put them in amongst the things to dissuade those animals. But again, it needs to be a small container so that the concentration of the fumes is doing its work. How do you keep the moss from coming in your house? You can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, unless you seal your house hermetically and you never leave it, which during COVID is sort of a thing. But yeah. um, <laughs> I mean, if you open a window, potentially a moth could get in. They're very small. They're only a half an inch big. Um, they are not the same as your pantry moths. They're not the same. We actually had a question on Wednesday about whether or not a uh, pantry moth or the she called them 
light bugs, light, light bugs. Light flies. Anyway, you were talking about the ones that are attracted to light and go into the lampshades. Oh, yeah. And no, they're not attracted to light. So you're very rarely going to ever see a clothes moth, which means the other moths in my house are now safe because the big ones don't eat keratin. Like the pretty ones, they're not they're not the risk. Clothes moths are half an inch long and they're sort of a shiny pale buff color. And that's, we did record this. So there's, there's, there's pictures. Wait, they look like this. Yeah. But they're only about a half an inch long. And carpet beetles, which are their brethren, look like that. But they're only a quarter inch to an eight, eighth of an or an eighth of an inch to a sixteenth of an inch long. So that is everything you didn't want to know. <laughs> and it, you know, it's it's like I, reading all of this. I felt like I felt like I was. Um, getting a lecture in, in modern housekeeping. You know, I was like mm. that we have to vacuum and that we need to wash things and we need to prevent dust and all of this. And of course I think of that or I kind of know it, but it, it really underlines the practices of good housekeeping that we all try to have that the reason that we don't let dust and animal hair accumulate, the reason that we periodically beat the rugs and take them out into the sunshine and shake them and whatever, the reason that we turn things over and vacuum the underside is not because our grandmothers told us to and not because our fathers were you know, being dictatorial, it's because that's where these undetectable pests go and that's how you keep them from being a problem in your house. So, and, and I have to be carpet at all might help, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and then one of the suggestions was to take needle nose pliers and pull back the carpet from under the baseboards, you know, under the, yeah, the, the baseboards and inspect the edges of carpeting for evidence of carpet beetles because that's where they like to be because that's the part that doesn't get stepped on and that's the part that doesn't get, you know, seen. Those beetles are smart, huh? <laughs> know how to survive, huh? They, they've, they've learned. Um, yeah. So that's, that is the end of my class. Does anybody have any other questions? No. So, go ahead. You go right ahead. What's up, Maddie? Uh, so when, say, for things that you're washing, Mm -hmm. if you need to hand wash them mm -hmm. does it have to be I guess does water temperature matter is there or is it mostly just the like water and soap is it's enough the, it's the presence of the soap okay cool and it's just like COVID so water temperature matters to me because I have arthritic hands and so I literally it hurts to put my hands into very cold water mm -hmm. um Anything that you can tolerate your skin touching, whether it's hot or cool, is too temperate to affect the larva because it has to either be below zero Fahrenheit or above 120 to even have a shot at affecting the larva. So it's the soap that oh, kills yeah. them, just like it kills COVID. So soak wash is a soap. It is a non-rinsing one. That's the one we, we have in the store. But if you're really worried about it, you might want to use a more, um, one that may, may need to be rinsed out of your clothing. Christine, did you have a question? Yeah, that was actually, that's going to be one of my questions was do the non-rinse soaks count when you're cleaning? And then also I just like, just in terms of, cause I know at least I've heard that lavender can also be a deterrent scent. And so if um, using lavender scented things can help not kill like a present infestation, but if that using that like in your soaks and when you're washing can help I, um, I, deter them from being attracted to it. So deterrence again, 
are wonderful. And like Sydney was asking, I would say that you want to do, if you want to have, instead of a mothball or the cedar scented death packet from SLA, if you wanted to put lavender and cedar scented, and I've heard other herbs are also um, helpful in, in like pine and you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. If you want to have those kinds of things in amongst your woolens in a sealed container and then put your pheromone trap on top as an early warning system. So it may seem extreme to some people who have never dealt with a moth infestation, but I can tell you that I kept my, I keep my yarns in a workroom that I often had the window open with a screen and I kept my cashmere in a basket and it was, I think it maybe was a little bit humid in the basket. So it was sort of like this perfect place. And I looked in the ba basket one day and my cashmere was wriggling and it was just a horror show and everything went, the whole basket had to go. And, um, I learned a very, very valuable lesson the hard way. And now it doesn't seem like that big a deal to me to consider these glue traps. Have I bought one yet? No. Am I going to? I think so. <laughs> I think I might because I have a lot of yarn at home and it's nice and I want to keep it so it's nice. Okay, so if that's everybody's questions, I am, I've, almost enjoyed talking about moths with you. 